Praise the Lord. We're here again today preaching in Shawnee Springs in Winchester, Virginia. Shawnee Springs is where we preach because this place in Winchester is a spiritual hot spot. Angels, demons, preachers, soldiers, all gave their lives at this place, the hospital at Winchester during the Battle of Opaquan, where 4,000 beds were here. Blood soaked the ground. Men cried out for Jesus to save them. And preachers preached the book, the King James Bible. Angels ministered prayers. Demons took lost souls to hell. And men cried out, Jesus, which is why we preach here because 150 years ago, this spot in Winchester, Virginia was the place where more activity from the spirit world was it than any other, any other place in Winchester. Whether it be in the church, whether it be in the, the town itself during people's prayer meetings, here at the hospital during the Battle of Opaquan was holy ground and we preach here today. War! War raged during the Civil War. It raged in Shenandoah. It raged up and down the coast. It rages today, everywhere. War, violence, and it was no different back in the days of the Israelites. You see, many people today reject the Bible because the Bible describes God as a God of war. God himself is a man of war. He has a sword. He has armies. He slays his enemies. And the Bible is a book of war, especially spiritual war. But during the times of the Israelites, the ancient people, God declared to Moses, go to war with the inhabitants of the promised land and in Deuteronomy chapter 21 many people reject the Bible because of this specific chapter Deuteronomy chapter 21 verse 10 when thou goest forth to war against thine enemies and the Lord thy God hath delivered them into thine hands and thou hast taken them captive and seest among the captives a beautiful woman, and hast a desire unto her, and thou wouldst have her to thy wife. Then thou shalt bring her home to thine house, and she shall shave her head, and pare her nails, and she shall put the raiment of her captivity off of her, and shall remain in thine house, and bewail her father and mother a full month and after that, thou shalt go in unto her and be her husband, and she shall be thy wife. And it shall be, if thou have no delight in her, then thou shalt let her go whither she will. But thou shalt not sell her at all for money. Thou shalt not make merchandise of her, because thou hast humbled her. Rape, they call it. People reject the Bible because they say, look, your God is a God of rape. He commands people to rape and capture women, rape them and make them their wives. Let's go on to read. In Deuteronomy 21. Go down. This is another verse that they reject the Bible from. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, this is verse 18, 21, 18. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him, will not hearken unto them, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out unto the elders of his city and unto the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of the city, this our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. 
and all the men of the city shall stone him with stones, that he die. So shalt thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Raping women, stoning your own child, I won't obey a God like that, they say. God's ways are not your ways, man. God's ways are far, far above your ways. You can't choose how you want God to be. You can't make up a God in your mind. You see, God is a God of war. God is a God of righteousness and justice and judgment. God's ways are far, far above the ways of man. You might want a hipster, hippie God. You might want a God that gives you sugar-covered, chocolate-covered cherries. You might want a God that gives you nothing but pleasure. But God is righteous, holy, and His ways are far above your ways. You see, in America, we, we love to venerate George Washington. George Washington, we say, what a great man. Well, George Washington was a man of war. And men will say, I love George Washington, but I hate God. Hypocrites! They use these verses in Deuteronomy 21 about the raping of the woman who's been taken captive and about the stoning of their own children. They use these verses to reject God. But what they don't do is put the Bible into context. You cannot pick and choose verses out of the Bible and say that I'm going to reject the almighty creator of this planet, heaven and earth because of a couple of verses that you don't agree with, man. Man, God's ways are far above your ways. And we turn now to John. Chapter 19, verse 31. We read these words. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they brake not his legs. Jesus was hung on the tree. Jesus was made to be a curse. Why? God's ways are not our ways. Jesus is the way. God made a way out, made a way for us to escape damnation and hell and judgment for sin. Man sinned and man sinned and God will punish sin. God is not just turn his head, wink his eye, and say, go ahead and sin. No, God is righteous. God is a God of justice. And God gave his own son, the man, Jesus, to hang on the tree. The Bible says in Deuteronomy, let's go back to Deuteronomy. And if a man hath committed a sin worthy of death, and he be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree, 
his body shall not remain all night upon the tree. But thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is a cursed of God, that thy land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. Jesus Christ hung on the tree. Jesus Christ became a curse. Cursed is everything that hangeth. God's ways are not our ways. Jesus Christ came from heaven. He left paradise. He came his only way that he knows how, which is in righteousness. And he willingly went to the tree, being made a curse for us, being made sin, who knew no sin, Jesus Christ the righteous. Hallelujah to God. God's ways are not our ways. We don't worship a God we've made up in our mind. We worship the God of the Holy Scriptures and His Son, Jesus. Isaiah 53. We read these words. Verse 10. Excuse me, before we read Isaiah, I want to tell you one thing. Satan is the God of this world, this realm, this sphere, cut off from heaven, kept in reserve for judgment and fire. This earth, Satan has dominion over. Why? Because Satan is so smart. Satan was cast into this realm, this sphere, this earth that was supposed to be for man. Now this is a mystery. We don't know why. But one of the reasons why I believe that Satan and man were both put in the same realm was so that God being righteous and being all things and knowing good and evil and God knows that sin must be destroyed. God's ways are not our ways. So God chose this way to destroy sin before all the angels so that he can be true before witnesses, before the witness of the heavenly hosts, so he can be judged to be truly righteous and holy God puts away sin and defeats it. Satan in Genesis 3.15. Let's go to Genesis 3.15. We all know Genesis 3.15. The Bible, the Word of God in heaven. Genesis 3.15. Satan, subtle, that means subtle, it means something that's hard to perceive, something that looks like it's the right way, but something's just quite not right about it. Satan is subtle. Genesis 3.15, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Jesus bruised Satan's head, the seed of the woman, the seed of Mary. Jesus Christ the righteous bruised Satan's head in hell when Jesus went down and stepped on that old serpent, defeating death, defeating hell, taking the keys of death and hell, and putting all things under his feet. The God of this world brought down to the lowest hell and Jesus Christ bruised his head. But Satan bruised his heel. Where? On the cross, hanging on the tree. As the nail went in to the heel of Jesus to nail our blessed Savior's foot to the wood, to that tree, Jesus bruised 
Jesus, Satan bruised Jesus. Satan bruised the heel as God ordained all the way back in Genesis when man sinned in Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Jesus pleases God. Jesus, the man, pleased God when Jesus willingly obeyed the Lord because Jesus, the man, the rabbi 2,000 years ago who walked this earth, Jesus, the man, read from Isaiah. And Jesus knew by the teacher, the Holy Spirit, that Jesus himself was called and chosen to be Messiah and to be the man who was tempted. God is not tempted. Jesus is God. How was Jesus tempted? Because Jesus was fully God and fully man. As today, if you're born again, you are fully a new man in Christ. But you have the old man. Jesus Christ was also fully man, able to be tempted, and fully God, able to resist all temptation. Isaiah 53, we go down to verse 11. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Jesus Christ's soul travailed on the cross, travailed in the Garden of Gethsemane, travailed when he had to live among wicked sinners as righteous Lot lived among wicked sinners in Sodom and they vexed his righteous soul imagine the divine beautiful Jesus the spotless Lamb of God living amongst the earth God man the divine first first man last man Jesus Christ is the last man. Jesus Christ walked the earth. Jesus Christ redeemed the first man, Adam, from the fall of Adam's sin. And Jesus Christ so travailed by having to walk among wicked, evil men. Jesus Christ so travailed on the cross. And it pleased God. Why does it please God? Because God was watching man overcome sin. God was watching an obedient man overcome sin. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Everything you've ever done wrong in this earth, every bad thought, every wicked deed, Every single thing you've ever, every bad sin you've ever committed, Jesus bore it on the cross. Not only yours, but the billions and billions of people that have lived on this earth. He took all of those wicked sins and he bore it. And this spiritually caused his soul to, to, to travail. And we go to 1 Corinthians. Excuse me, let's go to let's go to 1 John. Excuse me, John chapter 1 verse 29. John 1:29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. 
Jesus Christ, the Lamb. Jesus Christ, the spotless, sinless man, became sin for us. When you have doubt, when you have fear, when you're not sure if you're going to make it in this world, go back to the beginning, look to Jesus. For if you know him, he is your Sabbath. He is your rest. 1 Corinthians 5.7 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. We read these words. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Christ, the, the Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb, is sacrificed for us. And when the Israelites were in bondage to Pharaoh, God commanded Moses to tell them to put the blood on the doorposts and the death angel would pass over. And if the blood was on the doorposts, then the firstborn would be spared. And the Egyptians did not have this commandment, so they did not put the blood of the lamb on their doorposts. And all the firstborn of Egypt was slain by the death angel that night. Christ is our Passover. Christ is our Lamb. Christ is our Sabbath, our rest. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus, all ye who are heavy laden. For he will give you rest, for the Sabbath is rest, Jesus is rest for the Christian. We turn to Daniel, Daniel, prophecy. Chapter 9. Daniel 9, verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Jesus made an end to sin. Jesus sealed up the sure words of prophecy. Jesus made everlasting righteousness available in this world and in the world to come, especially for you if you believe. God's ways are not your ways. God made a way out for you to escape your sodomy, for you to escape your adultery, for you to escape your lying, your drunkenness, your fornication, your thievery. Whatever your sin is, Christ, the heavenly lamb, made a way out. Purge the old leaven. Purge yourself in the knowledge of Jesus Christ hanging on the cross, being made a curse, bearing the sins of many, and making reconciliation for God and man available by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you do, if you do, the Bible says, in John, verse 20, the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 28, for a lot of people say, well, 
I'm a doubting Thomas. I just can't believe I'm a doubter like Thomas. What happened to Thomas? Verse John 20, 28. And Thomas answered and said unto them, My Lord and my God. If you're doubting Thomas today, know this. Thomas admitted Jesus is Lord. Jesus is God. God himself died on that cross. God himself made a way out for your sins so you can escape eternal fire and damnation in hell with Satan by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ as the payment for your sins. Look to Jesus on the cross. Look and live. Ask Jesus today to be your personal Lord and Savior and he'll give you the gift of the Holy Ghost and you'll know you've been saved. Amen.